The sutta today is the simile of the snake. This is a long sutta, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit shorter. Okay. And see how it goes. Thus, as I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Arita, formerly of the vulture killers. I don't know why they want to kill vultures, but... I, I don't know that much about that country. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions, hindrances, by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. So that's just basically saying, don't pay attention to the five precepts at all. Several monks, having heard about this, went to the monk Arita and asked him, Friend Arita, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? That's always an interesting question. It's like me coming up to you and saying, Do you have this stupid view that you're holding on to? And that's basically what they're saying. Exactly so, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Then these monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him. Friend, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It's not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many discourses, the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering, and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the pieces of meat, etc., with the simile of a grass torch or a pit of coals or of dreams. Now, this is kind of interesting. I get questioned about dreams every now and then. People wanting me to interpret them. And I don't know. Yes, but... Uh, if you can interpret this dream, does it mean it's going to be true or not? I don't know. And honestly, I don't much care. It doesn't have anything to do with the meditation or how you interpret things. So... With the simile of the tree laden with fruit, or a, a slaughterhouse, or a snake, a, a sword stake, or a, a snake's head, the Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering, 
and much despair and how great it is the danger in them. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by them in this way, the monk, formerly of the four vulture killers, still obstinately adhered to their pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and told them all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk, formerly of the vulture killers, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell that monk, formerly of the vulture killers, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to that monk and told him, the teacher calls you friend. Yes, friend, he replied, he went to the blessed one after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The blessed one then asked him, Aretha, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Now, when you're doing your meditation and you have a, a hindrance that keeps coming up, you're engaging in it. You're making a big deal out of it in your mind. And as a result, it keeps getting bigger and keeps coming around. I don't care what the hindrance is. This keeps occurring. Now, there's a lot of people, especially in Asia, that have fear. They're really afraid of, from the time they're, they're uh, born until they grow up, they're told that if they aren't good, then uh, a hungry ghost is going to come and eat them up or some other thing like that. So when I'm teaching in Asia, where I have a lot of Asian students, they ask questions about this sort of thing, and I tell them continually, the way you overcome fear is by laughing at how silly it is. And they say, well, they do it one time and it didn't work. Well, how strong is that attachment to it? You have to do that every time the fear comes up without making it into a big deal. And eventually, it might take a few days, it might take a few weeks, who knows? But eventually, it will fade away and not come back and trouble you anymore. So your fears and anxieties we have a tendency to make a big deal out of it and we cause our own suffering because of it. We make ourselves sad because we make it into a big deal and we really try to uh, control and make it go away. But that doesn't work. That's getting involved with it. That's making it a big deal that's causing a lot of suffering that you're doing to yourself and you don't take responsibility for it. One of the reasons that I was so drawn to Buddhism was because you can't blame anybody else for your problems. 
your problems are your own. And what you do with them dictates what happens in the future. If you keep making a big deal out of them, then they're going to continue on. If you six are them, even though they're going to, it's going to come back, so what? But the six R's are not a stick to beat away these things. It's not a stick to make these things stop. The six R's are simply to let go of craving. And craving is the cause of these things arising. So you're getting rid of the cause without getting involved with the story about why you have this obstruction. Exactly so as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Wonder where he got that idea. That's really bizarre. Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, in many discourses I have stated that how obstructive things are obstructions and how they're able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering, and much despair. How great is that danger in them? With the simile of the skeleton, the pieces of meat, the grass torch, the pit of coals, dreams, borrowed goods, tree laden with fruit, slaughterhouse, a, a sword stake, a snake's head. I have stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification and much suffering and much despair and how great is the danger in them. But you, misguided man, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit, for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. This is, this is an interesting thing that I get asked uh, about sometimes. If somebody does something wrong and breaks one of the precepts, can you nullify the bad karma that can come from it? Quite often I tell people, if it's big, um, sometimes women come and tell me about they had an abortion and they're feeling very guilty for a very long time because they don't want to tell anybody about it. Or they've done something that in their mind, it's a real big thing. Can they nullify the bad karma of doing that? And I tell them, yes, go out and buy an animal that's going to be killed and let it go free. And as you're letting it go free, you let go of the guilty feeling of having committed that offense or that obstruction. Uh, for instance, this isn't a big thing, but it is a big thing. There was a woman in Malaysia, she liked to keep a very clean kitchen. And she prided herself in always cleaning everything off. And it was always pristine. And one day she saw a row of ants walking across her, her kitchen uh, cabinet. 
So she very quick, uh, very uh, carefully swept those ants off and took them outside and let them go free. And when she got back, there was another row of ants there. And this happened a few times. And finally, she went and got the insect killer and killed the ants. Now, before she did that, she was sitting four hours a day, had great meditation, very advanced meditation. After she killed all those ants, she couldn't sit for more than 20 minutes. Now, I had gone to Indonesia the first time I went to Indonesia. And I was gone for six weeks and she had this problem. And she, she told me, I cannot sit more than 20 minutes. That's my limit. So I said, okay, when I came back, I told her, you have to sit for no less than one hour. And what precept did you break? And she said, I didn't break a precept. I said, fine, you have to, you have to sit at least one hour until you see what the problem is, is caused by. And she called me up the next day and she said, I can't sit more than 20 minutes. I'm going to quit meditating. And again, I said, what precept did you break? And she told me the story about the ants. Fine. There's no judgment on my part. That's just something that she did. I told her in, in Malaysia at the, uh, the market, the meat market, they kill animals there. And they kill, they uh, chop off the head of the chickens if you want a chicken and uh, take the feathers off and that sort of thing. So I told her to go buy a couple of chickens. And take them into the forest and let them go free. And she had a five-year-old and a three-year-old daughter that she had to go with them. And they kept on questioning her as she went into the forest to let him go free. Why are we doing this, mom? It doesn't make sense. Why do you want to let these chickens go free? And they didn't understand. But she let them go, the chickens go free and the the uh, chickens, they went off about, oh, five or 10 feet and turned around and looked her straight in the eye. And they were very happy. Now, you have to understand what's going through the chicken's mind. It's in a tight space. There's a lot of other chickens and the chicken sees Every chicken that's pulled out, they die. So they have the fear of death. And they're full of anxiety. And then the butcher comes and he grabs one. Oh, man, this is it. I'm going to die. And the butcher ties, ties the feet up and gives them to this lady. Now, she, the chicken is still thinking, well, they're just taking me away and I'm going to die someplace else. And when they got to the forest and the lady cut the string that was holding the feet together. And let them go free. Now, they went from the fear of death, this being the worst day in their life, to the best day in their life, because they're going to keep living. So they really let go of a lot of anxiety and fear and 
dissatisfaction. And when they turned around and looked at her, the lady said she could feel the loving kindness coming to her from the chickens. Chickens aren't smart enough to radiate loving kindness. Oh, yeah, they are. They can do that. So the kids got so excited, they said, Mom, let's go do that again. So for a period of time, every week, they would go and let a couple chickens go free. And they said, well, the chickens don't have anything to eat. Let's take some corn and give them some corn to eat. So they did that. But the first time when she let go of this being that was full of fear and anxiety and knew they were going to die, and let them go with letting go of the killing of the ants that um, bad feeling that, that she had when she did that, it disappeared. And she felt exceptionally happy, a lot of joy coming up. So yes, you can do that sort of thing. And it doesn't matter. The bigger the animal is, the more relief there is. Sometimes I tell people, well, if we can find a whale and you can let it go free, that would be good. But it doesn't matter. So it's a real important thing to know that you can overcome any kind of hindrance, fear, anxiety, sadness, you can overcome these obstructions by giving life. That's one of the highest gifts you can give. There's only one higher gift, and that's giving Dhamma. So it's a real important thing for you to understand that the more you have hindrances bother you, there is a remedy. You can buy fish and let them go free. I know some people like to buy lobsters and let them go free. Oh, strange sound coming from the microphone here. Uh, but the thing is, when you let them go free, even when you let fish go free, they'll go out a little ways in the water, turn around, and they'll look you in the eye. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. I didn't believe it till I started doing it myself. And every time, whatever animal I let go free, they came back and thanked me, basically. It's kind of fun. So, then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, what do you think? Has this monk, Aritha, formerly of the vulture killers, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? How could they, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the monk, formerly of the vulture killers, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. He had to give up an idea that he was holding very dear, and that was hard for him to do. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. And we're still recognizing him, recognizing him 2,600 years later. So holding on to these kind of wrong views can be troublesome for you. I shall question the monks on this matter. 
then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me? As this monk, Aretha, formerly of the vulture killers, does when he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. Any self-respecting monk, that would be a joke, kind of. Why would I go along with that kind of view? No, venerable sir, for many discourses, the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated how sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and much despair, and how great is the danger in them. With the simile of the skeleton, the snake's head, and how great is the danger in all of these different things. Good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many discourses, I have stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they're able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering, much despair, and how great is the danger in them. <clears throat> One of the things that you'll start noticing as you go deeper into your practice is that you will have disenchantment of material things. You still, have, you still have to do things, but they don't cause excitement. One of the things that in Asia in particular is food. Well, if you eat this food first and this one next and this one next, it's really, really good that way. And what happens when you start going deeper in your meditation is you really start not to be excited by food. You have to eat food because you need energy to continue on. But it's nice to get your favorite food, but it's nothing to get excited about. It doesn't make your mouth water anymore thinking about food. And that happens with your daily activities too. You have a lot more equanimity. You don't get so excited with emotional upsets. And you let people alone that have the emotional upsets. And the best thing to do is to practice your generosity and radiate loving kindness to that person that's all excited that's saying things that don't make sense, that's saying things that are hurtful to other people. So this is the true advantage of doing the meditation and keep your meditation going all the time, using your six R's. Anytime your mind starts to get a little excited, And you'll get a lot more confidence in the Eightfold Path because that's what doing the six R's leads to. So you get more of a feeling of how all of this stuff is interconnected. It's really a shame. I gave a talk yesterday and uh, I was telling them that it's really a shame that Buddhism is considered a religion because it's not. It's mental development. It's how to live a wholesome life, how to live a happy life. 
and you watch things, as I say, on the television or videos or movies, they're always exemplifying the suffering. Oh, this is really something. There's a lot of suffering going on there. It makes you feel good, right? Doesn't really, it just gets you excited. So the whole reason of keeping your precepts leads to disenchantment and balance. And people around you will start to have that same sort of thing happen with them because you're being the example. So, okay, now we're going to get to the simile of the snake. Here, monks, some misguided man, learn the Dhamma, discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, and birth stories marvels and answers to questions. That's kind of cute. My name is Marvel, my, my lay name. <laughs> anyway, but having learned the Dhamma, <coughs> they do not examine the meaning of these things, of these teachings with wisdom. What does that mean? That means examining things with this disenchantment. Somebody doesn't have to be a meditator to teach Dhamma and teach it correctly, but they do study and they deeply understand and they have a lot of confidence in the Buddha's teaching. One of the things that David just ran across in an old book is that people that have complete confidence in the Buddha, they will be reborn in the earthbound spirits for a period of time, and then they'll go up step by step, all of six, six or seven steps of the Deva Lokas. And then they'll be reborn as a human being. And in that lifetime, they will be a Pacheka Buddha. So there are different ways of experiencing this. And there's no right and wrong. In the Anguttara Nikaya, it says very specifically that People that practice meditation, people that are studying, they should get along and agree with each other when it comes to Dhamma. But that doesn't happen these days. Oh, he's only studying suttas. He doesn't know anything. I'm a meditator. Well, you can have a lot of wrong views doing the meditation. And the person doing the studying can have a lot of right views. So why is there disagreement? Sometimes there's some disagreement with how the um, I just I can't think of it, it just slipped my mind. That happens these days. Don't get old, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. Uh, the Eightfold Path. Now, some uh, people that are doing meditation, a, a lot of meditation that doesn't include the six R's, they're doing one point in concentration. They say that right speech, right action, right livelihood, they're all part of morality. And you don't have to worry about that. 
because when you're meditating, you're keeping your morals. But what happens when you're not meditating? You could be breaking those precepts. So it's only a five-fold path, not an eight-fold path. And that's, that's a disagreement with uh, some monks that think that you don't need to include right, right uh, speech, right action, right livelihood. You don't need to in include that when you're sitting in meditation. And of course, I don't agree with that. And I've, I've said that many, 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 many times that I don't agree with that. But it's not a reason to be attached to it. It's just an opinion. Everybody can have their own opinion. It doesn't really matter. You be the example and it doesn't matter at all. Okay. But having learned the Dhamma, the, some people, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they do not gain reflective acceptance of them. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduced to their harm and suffering for a long time. So you don't have to argue with anybody. That's their own problem. Why is that? Because the wrong grasp of those teachings. Suppose a man meeting a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and grasp it, grasp its coils or tail. It would turn back on him and bite his hand or his arm or one of his limbs. And because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. So too, some misguided men learn the Dhamma and because of that wrong grasp, they suffer greatly. Here some clansmen learn the Dhamma, the discourses, the answers to questions. And having learned the Dhamma, they examine the meaning of his teachings with the wisdom Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. Uh, last week, I suggested something, and I was wondering if people actually tried it. And we were talking about getting in the realm of nothingness, and every time a thought comes up in your mind, you ask, where did that come from? Whose thought is that? Did you do that? It's really an interesting experience if you do that. It doesn't matter what feeling arises. Where did that come from? Who caused that to arise? Well, it's from past experience and past breaking of precepts. So you're doing it to yourself because of your attachments. And I suggested that I did it for six months. I don't, I'm kind of fanatic with things. 
and I want to go to the end of it and see what happens. And I did it for six months. Now, I didn't do it every time. I had thoughts come up and I got caught by them. But finally, when I remembered to ask myself the question, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I looking for an answer to something when there's no real question? What am I doing? Why am I so involved with nonsense thoughts and feelings? Whose feelings are they? So I suggested that last week, now some of you listened to it last week, some of you didn't, but I was just wondering if anybody tried because it, it is an interesting experience. Where did that thought come from? Why am I holding on to this kind of idea? Where did that come from? And when you see that, you naturally start 6 ring You're just letting go of the craving. That's what 6 Rs are all about. So, it's a way of purifying yourself. And it can be fun. And it, it can definitely help your sense of humor because your mind is crazy. It comes up with some of the most bizarre thoughts and feelings and opinions and ideas. Wow. That's one of the reasons I wanted to call this an oh wow meditation, because there's so many oh wows that you can give yourself. And these are insights into your true nature of how you get attached to things and how you won't let them go. Oh, I've, I've got to think about this. No, you don't. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to the sutta. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others or winning debates. They experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings, being rightly grasped by them, conduce to welfare, happiness, and for a long time. Why is that? Because right grasp of those teachings. Suppose a man needing the snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake, and caught it rightly by the, with a cleft stick, or having done so, grasped rightly by the neck. Then, although the snake might wrap its coil around your hand, <coughs> or arm or limbs, still it would not come to death or deadly suffering because of that. Why? because of his right grasp of the snake. This is why this is called the simile of the snake. Here some clansmen learn the Dhamma. Why? Because of the right grasp of those teachings. Therefore, monks, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember this accordingly. And when and you do not understand the meaning of the statements, then ask either me, ask me about it, or those monks who are wise. But trust your intuition. That's something that people forget a lot. They forget about their intuition. Their regular nonsense thoughts coming through are very loud. 
Your intuition is quiet. Your intuition is always right. Always. But you have to learn how to interpret them correctly. Okay, we have a simile of the raft. I will show you how the Dhamma is similar to the raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of craving and clinging. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Monks, suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from fear. But there was no ferry boat or bridge going from to the far shore. Then he thought, there's a great expanse of water whose shore is dangerous and fearful and whose further shore is safe and free from fear. But there's no ferry boat or bridge going across to the far shore. Suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bind them together into a raft. And suppose by the raft, making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across the far shore. Then the man collected grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bound them together into a raft. And supported by the raft, making an effort with his hands and feet, he got safely across the shore. That must have been a very small raft that he made. <laughs> uh, then when he got across and arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me. Since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across the far, far shore. Support, suppose I were to hoist it in my hand and load it on my shoulder. <coughs> Excuse me. And then go wherever I want. Now, monks, what do you think by doing so? Would that man be doing, uh, be doing what should be done with the raft? No. You don't need to carry it around. That's carrying around an obstruction, isn't it? And that's causing more suffering, isn't it? By doing that, the man would be doing what he should have done with the raft. Here, monks, when a man got across and arrived at the far shore, he might think, this raft has been very helpful to me. Since supported by it, making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across the far shore. Suppose I were to haul it onto the dry land or set it adrift in the water and go wherever I wanted. Now, monks, it is by doing so that a man would be doing what he should be done with the raft. I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to the raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of craving and clinging. When you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even good states. You naturally abandon good states when you get to the realm of equanimity. You don't hold on to these good states. You don't get over, over joyful. 
overexcited by good states. You can still experience them, and it's nice, but it's not anything to hold on to. Your mind just will just say, that was nice. Oh, it disappeared. Okay, let's go on and do something else. Uh, monks, there are six standpoints of view. What are the six? Here, monks, an unta untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones. That's a person that has done the study, but they don't do the meditation. But they live an exemplary life. They live a life free from obstructions. They can be a very, very effective teacher. Or it can be a meditator. It can be a noble one, somebody that's successful with their practice. Or there's someone who has no regard for true men and uh, unskilled and disciplined in their dhamma, regards material form thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Now that's what I was talking about just a minute ago when you start going, where'd that thought come? Whose thought is that? Why is that thought there? Why am I paying attention to it? And I've talked with a few of my students in a very deep way about their own personal practice. And what happens with their mind? Do they have weird thoughts coming in? No. They can sit for long periods of time without having any disturbing thoughts. They still have thoughts and feelings that can come in. But it would be um, feelings that are that that you verbalize in your mind. A feeling can come up. You can feel a fly, or you can feel a pain in your body. But you just have that thought one time, and you're not attached to it. So you can sit for long periods of time with a clear mind that's very observant without having any obstructions in it. And that happens to me quite often. I'll, I'll sit for sometimes an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and then I start thinking, well, I better get up and do something or it's going to be a nothing day. So that is the sign of a well-trained mind. A mind that doesn't get excited because some emotional stuff comes up. And the links of dependent origination depend on having some kind of obstruction causing it. It's all conditioned, right? Right? Yeah? But when you sit with a quiet mind and you don't move, uh, I read a story about aboriginals in Australia. They sometimes would sit for hours without moving. And then they would get up and make a basket or do whatever they had to do. But they did it without obstructing thoughts. That's to be admired. So the more you keep your practice going with your daily activities, the more clear your mind is going to become. 
And there's a lot of relief and a kind of satisfaction and clarity that happens in your mind. So that's part of the advantage of why you're doing this. He regards feelings thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards perceptions thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards formations thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And this standpoint of views, namely, this is myself, this is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. Do you know of anything that isn't subject to change? There is an answer for this. You can say no, but the only thing that's not subject to change is change itself. Tricky, huh? There's always change. It's always going to be there. I shall endure as long as eternity. Well, that's some people's view, and it's okay for them to have that view. It doesn't matter. That's only philosophy. But... When you're talking about impermanence, everything is impermanent. Everything is subject to change. And it will continue to be like that. Monks, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones, is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, regards material form thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. I run across people that they don't want to use the word I or me or mine. And it's awkward talking. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm being impersonal when I do that. No, they're not. They're being attached as anybody else. But when you know and see that this is not me, it's not mine, it's not myself, you don't even think about it. You just see the impersonal nature of what it is. And there's real relief in that. <clears throat> he regards perception, feeling, formations, and consciousness. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized. Encountered, sought, mentally pondered on, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. You don't think about whether you, you're talking about impersonal or not. You don't think about it, you just are. And that's a mistake a lot of people doing practice well, I ask a question when somebody comes up and they, they have an a, attachment. One of the favorite attachments when you get deeper in your meditation is boredom. And my question always is, who's bored? 
Who's taking that personally? Oh, I'm seeing it in an impersonal way. No, you're not. You can't fool me. You are doing it in a personal way. Go through it. It's not you. It's not yours. Why are you making a big deal out of it? So, and this ten point of views, namely the self and the world are the same. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. This is one of the beliefs that a lot of people that uh, are into other religions, they're looking for something to be permanent. So they say God is permanent. And Again, they can do that. That's okay. It's interesting. Okay, since he regards them thus, his mind is not agitated about what is non-existent. Why would you get agitated about things? This is having the equanimity and the disenchantment in your daily life. Okay, now we're going to talk about agitation. When this was said, a certain monk asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be monks. Here a monk, someone who thinks, alas, I had it. Alas, I have no longer. Alas, I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then sorrow grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. That is agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be monk. Here, someone does not think thus, alas, I had it. Alas, I have, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, can I, can I not get it? Then he, he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament, does not weep, beating his breast, and become distraught. This is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable sir, can there be agitation about what one is non-existent internally? There can be monk. Here the monk, someone has the view, this is self. This is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. It's one of the things I found real interesting about most of the religions. They, they talk about eternal, but they don't have a real sense of the time. You can be in a realm for expansions and contractions of the universe. So time doesn't really have anything to play with Buddhism. It's just something that happens and this is how it works. He hears the Tathagata or the disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, 
and underlying tendencies for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. He thinks thus, I shall be annihilated, so I shall perish, so I shall be no more. Then sorrows, breathes, and laments, weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. Venerable sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent in, internally? There can be. Here, Someone does not have the view. The self and the world are the same. I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata or his teacher of, or the disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. Here, he does not think I shall be annihilated. What is there to be annihilated? What is there to die? It's just a continuation of things happening, isn't it? It's all impermanent. So how could you be annihilated? So I shall, I shall perish. I shall be no more. Then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep, beating one, his breast and become distraught. This is how there's no agitation about what is non-existent in, internally. Now, impermanence and not self. Ah, this is going to be interesting, right? You may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. But do you see any such possession? No, venerable sir. Good. I too do not see any possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. And that might endure as long as eternity. You may well crave and cling to the doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and one who craves and clings to it. But you do see, and do you see any such doctrine of self? No, venerable sir. I too do not see any doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and one who clings to it. You may well take as support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and one who takes it as a support. But do you see any such support of views? No, venerable sir, I too do not see any support of views 
that would arouse, that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and in one. There being a self, would there be what belongs to myself? Yes, venerable sir. Or there being what belongs to a self, would there be myself? Yes, venerable sir. Since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended as true estab truly established, then the statement for views, the self, the world as the same, or death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it be an untruth and completely foolish teaching? What else could be, venerable sir? It would be an utter and completely foolish teaching. Well, that pretty much uh, eliminates a lot of the religion, doesn't it? <clears throat> what do you think is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. What do you think? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? And then it goes on to perception and formations and consciousness. Therefore, monks, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form, all feeling, all perception, all formations, all consciousness, should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus, a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Being dis disenchantment, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. What relief with that kind of realization. So I've been talking for a long time and I'm only about halfway through the sutta. If you want to, I would suggest you get the Majjhima Nikaya sutta number 22 and look at the rest of it for yourself because it would take me another two hours to get the, through this particular sutta. It is long, but it basically keeps saying the same thing over and over again. So, so I guess I will, uh, Share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be.
May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Happy New Year.